You're listening to a Meat Smith Harvest. This is the podcast that encourages and equips you to grow your home around the harvest. Welcome, Meat Smiths. This dialogue picks up where we left off in our last episode's conversation. You can find part one on our website, YouTube, or iTunes. If the content resonates with you, please consider supporting our team by going to patreon.com backslash meatsmith and donating a small monthly pledge. This goes directly toward more free media headed your way. Thanks for staying tuned for part two. Cool. Well, let's get to the butchery. Okay. Because we should. Okay. And we're running out of time. Um, I mean, we're never out of time, I guess. But um, we wanted to try to tackle butchery proper. Did you have something in La Rue's gastronomique to start us off? Oh, or was I that more know. cookery related? I, well, just the wonderful fact that I looked up sheep, thinking that was the more generic term. Uh-huh. And under sheep, all it said was, see mutton. And then you go to mutton, <laughs> and it's five, well, six. Oh, my gosh. This whole, whoa. Many, many pages. Oh, my gosh. So it is... Um, 13 pages wow. in the culinary French dictionary on mutton. That's so cool. Mouton. Because mutton is so good. And this is probably a, uh, let's see, they probably aren't talking about, I don't know. Well, I don't want to read this while we're talking. But um, anyway. Wait, we're both like. I know, it's super interesting. <laughs> it's super fun. <laughs> Hang on, everybody. Yeah. Let's go look at this. <laughs> Mutton is is so wonderful. It's so delicious. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it's darker. It's believed to be a little more digestible, though this depends on the cut, according to La Rousse Gastronomique. Uh huh. You know, we do have a uh, for a visual demo. We have a quartering mm. a you mm-hmm. uh, video in our membership. Yeah. So if you get real interested in seeing how Brandon likes to divide it up. Just like a 20 minute video yeah. in there. Yeah. And lamb is really, it's very approachable. It's very doable mm-hmm. uh, for the novice. It's a very simple carcass. And once you really, once you've broken down a lamb, you can kind of break down everything because they're all mm-hmm. quadrupeds, they're all mm-hmm. four legged beasts, which means the essential moves, the initial moves are the same. Yeah. Can be the same on all of them. So. I frequently quarter lambs and pigs the exact same way. Yeah. Um, it's kind of easier to see, too, because it's a smaller animal. Yeah, yeah. So it's almost formulaic, or it can mm-hmm. be. You know, you can get as fancy as you want with yeah. it, but um, it can be just very... It's do- very simple. Yeah. Just and then the cool thing about lamb is once you've quartered it, those quarters just about fit in your oven. Like yeah. You could just call it a day. Yeah. And you're good because yeah. that's how wonderful lamb is. Uh-huh. Um, that's what I love about British lamb butchery. So from the slaughterhouse, and this is a trick that you can do too, in order to facilitate simple butchery on a smaller animal and to suggest the way it ought to be cooked, the, the butcher slaughterman... They, um, the British slaughtermen, they tuck the front legs up close to the neck. And you can do this with hmm. a, you know, piece of butcher's twine. Um, where they, they take off the pin bones. So you've just got the front shanks. And then you, you can only do this while the lamb is freshly, after the lamb has been freshly gutted. Before rigor mortis sets in and everything right. is stiff. Right. And then you can't do this. But while it's still loosey-goosey... You tie around the back neck and then around the front shanks. Uh-huh. And you tighten that and it pulls the shanks up way tight. And the effect is that you can leave the shank on the shoulder. You could basically just leave the shoulder whole as its own quarter. Huh. And it'll fit in your oven. Whereas if you don't do that, the shanks are, and front right. legs are straight out. And they're, right. now they're just, it's just this one arm bone sticking way out on your yeah. shoulder roast. And it, it won't fit in your oven. Yeah. It's kind of annoying. So it's a great move. I'd say do it. That's cool. Um, and uh, so if you can quarter a sheep, then you can butcher everything else. And 
if you can quarter a sheep, you also can stop. Like you could probably just stop cutting and yeah. you're good to go. Yeah. <laughs> um, because those are proper sized cuts. And so for ease, I would say in, in order to more easily conceptualize the quartering, split the sheep down the spine, right down the middle, if you can, with a saw. And it's easier if the leg, the back legs are what, nice and wide for you. I have a 31 inch gambrel, so it stretches the legs way out and that mm -hmm. makes the center split a little easier. Mm -hmm. And then you can take one side, lay it down on your cutting table, and then go back to the rear end where the butt of the sheep is, the back leg. And you can see where the spine goes out above the pelvis and out to the tail. And it takes a hard corner there. And it's, it's almost a right corner, but not quite. Mm -hmm. It's not quite a right angle. Mm -hmm. And you can see that it, where it, that corner is, it is not necessary. It's not a vertebrae, but a disc. The disc are the little white lines in between each vertebrae. And at that corner, it's denoted by, that happens at a disc mm -hmm. in the spine. And if you go one vertebra from that corner in the direction of the head, and then you put your knife into that disc in between the two vertebrae, that's where you quarter. That's where you take off the back leg. Okay. And we won't talk about the technical element of doing that, but it's really simple. Just cut there. And when you encounter bone, you can saw it. Um, and you'll just encounter one tiny little bone. That's the advantage of it. Um, the little tiny piece of vertebrae that your knife is resting on. That's the only bone that's there. Then you have the back leg. Now with the back leg, it's still kind of long because you have the shank on it and the sirloin. So if your oven can fit that, just there you go. Yeah. Beauty. <laughs> Done. Leave it. Um, that's a full leg of lamb. It's so delicious. It's so awesome. Roast the whole thing. Olive oil, salt, um, one thing that I read in Hugh Friendly Winningstall that we've done before that I love is you take a paring knife and you take a little spear of garlic and a little sprig of rosemary and like half an anchovy and you layer that on your paring knife and then you stick that into the leg of lamb and then you withdraw the paring knife and now you've wedged the anchovy, the garlic and the rosemary in the lamb. You just do that all over. It's so awesome. And yeah. Then roast like a little salt olive oil roast crown or something on its head it's like a grassy yeah it, it's it's a grassy hill it is, is what it is yeah of rosemary um so that's a wonderful way to go and usually a leg of lamb that large with the sirloin and everything you're gonna have leftovers and that is wonderful that's where shepherd's pie comes in mm. And this way you can really prolong the meal. So the next day, you know, you pull the leftovers out of the fridge and you cut off all the meat and you can cut it into smallish bits. My favorite way is actually, you know, those old hand crate kitchen grinders mm -hmm. that I would never dream of putting fresh meat into because the tedium would kill me. <laughs> um, but you can take your cubed up last night's leftover leg of lamb put that in the hopper and grind that stuff. And mm -hmm. it just grinds it this perfect, it's like it chunks it, it's perfect. Yeah. And that is the base for your leg of lamb. You put all of that in a pan with uh, either some baked, cubed bacon or lard or butter and fry it up with some finely chopped carrots, onions, and celery or whatever, potatoes. No, don't do that yet. Carrots, onions, and celery, <laughs> maybe some parsnips. And you're just kind of cooking the vegetables at that point. And then once the veg is pretty much cooked, it doesn't have to be all the way cooked. Yeah. You still have a little crunch to it. You make your mashed potatoes and then you layer those right on top mm. and um, yeah. make super buttery ones. And then <laughs> for an extra special treat, you could make fork lines in the potatoes. You know, oh, you yeah. press your fork on it and it makes a whole bunch of lines. So it increases the surface area of the potatoes to enhance the possibility of crisposity. And then you could even go further and just do a little bit of stock on top. Oh, yeah. Just yeah. a little bit yeah. of nice, rich uh, lamb stock from yeah. the lamb's head, perhaps. There you go. And just just a little bit. You know, you're not, you're not like submerging it or anything. And then you put that in a, what, 425 degree Fahrenheit mm -hmm. oven 
for as long as it takes to start to brown the potatoes and the stock will help that a little bit it's like a glaze on top that's our shepherd's pie. super delicious mm -hmm. shepherd's pie and, and then yeah. we have to take it out and not eat it for about 45 minutes while it cools down for it's the kids. It's so hot. <laughs> yeah. So you and I like to eat things hot, mm -hmm. but yeah. Um, it's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the back leg. Uh, and, you know, if you don't want it whole, okay, here's the fun thing about the back leg. I actually might be able to find proof of this. Hang on. I got to real quick say what, how wonderful this shepherd's pie is. Every time I have a baby, yeah. I make this ahead of time. And I know it's a it's a little bit of a compromise, but I freeze it. Yeah. And then it's my meal right after I have a baby, my first one. Yeah. It's it's unlike anything. It's so rich. It's rich. It's it gives me so many good um, calories. It's energetic. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's the ultimate comfort food, but in a really really nutritious way. Yeah. So yeah. so cool i'm looking at the proof of what i'm about to say right now but i it wouldn't make sense to show you when you're standing in front of your long leg of lamb with shank with leg where the femur is and with sirloin where the pelvis pelvis is yeah that can be like two I mean, and a half feet long yeah oh, that would be a real big lamb okay i think too yeah deep. it can be big it could be yeah. too big for your oven yeah now you could divide that into three parts and there are way specific places to do that but there also aren't like <laughs> every western culture at least has done it differently uh, yes and i'm looking at it right now oh okay la russe gastronomique uh-huh they've got the english the american oh. and the french oh neat so the french naturally they're tempted to magnanimity in feasting and so they'll even leave the loin attached oh my gosh look at that thing. the t-bones right so the small of the back attached to the full leg and that's the baron dad no can i here no, can hang try. on watch wait put it on your lap i'm gonna do this oh. okay because then we can that okay one? that's the french yeah uh-huh that is the baron the baron. <laughs> it's huge. That's the loin. That's where the T-bones are. That's uh -huh. both legs coming off the back. Yeah. So that is half the lamb. That's how big that roast wow, is. Wow, yeah. So that's allowed. Okay. That's one thing that's allowed. <laughs> so this is the English. I love oh. the English over here. Oh, okay, yeah. Here's the back of your leg. Here's the full leg. Uh-huh. Pretty much cut at the same, well, sort of, almost, the same spot that we were talking about. This is a little further back. But then even with that, they take it and they cut it right there. If you can see with my finger. Uh -huh. That's what that is. Shank end. Shank end. Huh. So the actual patella, the kneecap, is way right. down here. Yeah. That's what, so that's what we call a lamb shank. Right. The British just leave the back end of the leg of lamb. In the American cut way to cut a leg, they've basically cut the leg of lamb in half. Yeah. So that's the shank end. I've also called it. I heard it called the Lamb Henry. Henry. I don't know who Henry is. <laughs> Probably a king. Um, and then this is the rest of the leg. They call that the fillet uh -huh. of leg. It's, uh, you know, there's the other half. See, it would go right there. Yeah. So that is completely different than how we do it in America, but uh -huh. utterly allowed. Like, you can just do that. It's, <laughs> it's quite appropriate. It's a great way. And if you were just to guess how to cut up the back of a leg, you would accidentally either do the British uh -huh. or the American or the French way. And what is this American way? Um, they don't show it very well here. Okay. It's not very clear to me. Okay. They make leg steaks out of it, which yeah, I think is yeah, very silly. I've confusing. never liked that. Um, a French leg, that's right at the pelvis. Mm -hmm. Their division is not quite at the vertebrae. That's where I'm talking. To make the yeah. division for the back leg. They're doing it way up here. Yeah. Which is more sense. standard. That's yeah. that's not uncommon. Um, well, you probably run into some differences in breed at this point too. Mm -hmm. Right? Like different 
braids lend themselves to different yeah. points of cut, I would guess. Yeah, and it is neat. I do like, they didn't show it in the other ones, but on the American one, you can see they French the tip of the shank. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. That's cute. And that's to help you carve it. Okay. So if you've ever seen those little paper crowns. I'll set myself back up here again. Uh huh. There we go. Yeah. The little paper crowns on a French shank. Oh, yes. So if you leave the shank bone sticking out, you don't leave it that way. You cut the meat off of it. Yeah. And then you roast it. And, they, and then when they pull it out, they put that little paper crown on it. Uh -huh. It looks really cool. Yeah. But that's so you can hold it because the bone is crazy hot. Yeah. And it rests. You know, you let the leg of lamb rest for 30 minutes at least. Let it rest before you cut it. Yeah. And then you can hold that and you can carve off of that leg. Okay. It's practical. Yeah. And beautiful. Yeah. Um, Neat. So I think that's the back leg. Yeah. I usually, the back leg is just too suggestive of a large feast. It lends itself to that. So mm. I never really butterfly it into little tiny i never seem it out into a bottom round top round i have round knuckle it's silly they're all they're so tiny mm -hmm. i'm never feeding tininess i'm tiny yeah. it's like we're always we need to eat a lot so yeah. <laughs> large big cuts yeah and that's what the leg of lamb represents to me yeah <clears throat> um so that's how to cut and cook the yeah. leg of lamb which is really the whole point of all of this is at the end of the day, if like we always say, if you don't know what the piece is called that you're eating, but it tastes good, then you cut it properly. Right. That because butchery is a servant of cookery. I've heard you say that if if um if you cut something into Mickey Mouse shapes, yeah, but at the end of the day you've cooked it well. And it tastes then, well. Then you have cut cut it properly. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. That's the point of butchery. There is no other standard of butchery for the home. Maybe, you know, if you're going to put it in a case, you have the added standard of what sells, right? Right. But that's usually wrong anyway. Like <laughs> denuded, square, cylindrical, something that never happens on a lamb that requires a massive amount of trim to even coax out of a carcass. Yeah. That's just all the other standards are stupid if there are any. The one that makes sense is, does it taste well? Then you cut it proper yeah and you did a good job yeah. so yeah to that end can you re re um i guess we're talking about something we've already covered but mm -hmm. the point the, the your guiding tool or framework is how a carcass has moved during mm -hmm. its life and that will dictate where you cut in its death right like um what's what's been mo used and right um, what's maybe fatty, more fatty. Yeah, and that is all implicit in where we quarter mm -hmm. the animal. Right. The yeah. quartering step is not arbitrary. They're not arbitrary markers. Mm -hmm. We took the leg off, the back leg off, at that point that I described because that separates all of the muscles that articulate that big limb and support the weight of the animal. It separates them from the muscles of the spine, mm -hmm. which do nothing. Mm. They are therefore tender. The long muscle on the spine is pan friable, hot and fast. It doesn't need prolonged cooking to become chewable. Mm -hmm. It already is. Mm -hmm. In fact, it makes an excellent carpaccio or mm -hmm. tartare. Okay. Um, That's true. Whereas the back leg, well, that would also make a good carpaccio. But mm -hmm. uh, it's, that's why I don't like lamb steaks. I don't like flash, hot, quick Mm -hmm. uh, frying of the back leg because that mus musculature has more collagen. It's more tough. It gets more exercise from the lamb, launching it over your fence for greener grass. Uh -huh. um, it's not uh, it's not suited to pan frying mm -hmm. in my mind because mm -hmm. it will remain chewy. Now you could unknit the whole back leg, and you will find tender muscles. But uh, then you have a mountain of silver skin and trim and fat. And that's fine if you can use it all, but that's mm. a whole nother step. Now mm -hmm. you're making stock out of all your silver skin and collagen and fat, which mm -hmm. I guess works. I, for me, I don't have time for it. And I have, it is no compromise at all. Quite the opposite to just cook the whole back leg complete with all of those flavor enhancing <laughs> different diversity. That's a little redundant of textures. Yeah. 
going on. Well, back there. we've always said in our household, it's easier to cook for eight people yeah. than it is to cook for two people. Right. It's Especially just... when you're dealing with whole carcasses. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the physiology of these carcasses of quadrupeds is what determines where we quarter. We've separated the back leg from the musculature on the spine, which is tender. The muscle musculature on the back leg is tough. Mm -hmm. And then you get up to the front shoulder. Again, articulating the neck up and down all day, you know, walking with that front leg makes all of that musculature tough, knitted and separated by very tough, tough fascia and ligaments and tendons and collagen, all of which needs low and slow cooking to break it down mm -hmm. so that you're not just nibbling on gristle the whole time. Mm -hmm. um, a young enough lamb shoulder is very roastable, actually. And you can roast it hot and fast if it's young enough. Because again, it's a matter of exercise and use. It just, it's only been using those muscles for like eight months. Mm -hmm. So they aren't tough yet. Um, the cool thing about ewes, about older sheeps and muttons, is they tend to get super fat. And this really distincts them from goats. Distinguishes them from goats. Goats are lean. Uh, sheeps are fatties. And they can put on a lot of subcutaneous fat. Mm -hmm. What that means is, if you have a ewe, you can roast everything. <laughs> so this simplifies your cooking big uh -huh. time. Because everything has an inch of fat on it. And if that is the case, nothing will be dry if you roast it. So we just recently had this... I can't remember if I, I didn't... I don't know if I took a picture of it or not, but a lamb neck from a couple ewes that I slaughtered recently, the farmer generously gave us a lamb neck, which is like my favorite cut on the whole mm -hmm. carcass. They're all my favorite, but especially the neck. <laughs> and it was huge. It's a little more like, your favorite. Bigger than my head, the uh -huh. circumference, and had two and a half inches of fat around the whole neck. Yeah. Lambs put it on up there, you yeah. know, especially rams where they're bearing the weight of their horns and they're developing to fight. I feel like their testosterone just backs it on up mm. on the shoulder and the neck. Uh, but so a huge inch and a half of fat. I put, I took a whole bulb, you know, clove, multiple bulbs of garlic, cut it in half, mm -hmm. put it in the pot, lamb neck, salt, like just a slosh of white wine. I can't remember if I did anything else. That might have been it. It was, it was almost dry in there. Except yeah, for the... just a little slosh at the bottom. We're talking yeah. like half an inch. Yeah. And then um, lid in a 300 degree oven for roughly all day. And it was amazing because all of that fat, even though it's a super tough cut, all that fat just melts and becomes a braising liquid and breaks down the tough neck. Mm -hmm. It was so good. Yeah. And... Um, Though it's fun to cook with lots of fat on your cuts, untrimmed, leave it on, please. <laughs> because in that long roasting process, when you get towards the end, you can add root vegetables. You can add potatoes right. or parsnips or onions even. Mm -hmm. um, just open the lid, throw in a bunch of chopped vegetables and put it back in the oven. Mm -hmm. And now it's cooking in that medium, the dripping mm -hmm. from the roast lamb neck. Yeah. Um, so really delicious. And that's all part of just the rationale that breaks down the carcass of a lamb. Mm -hmm. the hunt is up, the hunt How many people do you know you would say truly share your back to the land values? Or your passion for home scale craft meat curing? Or simply love the multifaceted beauty of a good meal as obsessively as you do? Maybe a handful? At farmsteadmeatsmith.com we've created an online community of hundreds of omnivores from around the world and a platform for them to learn from and inspire one another. In addition to our major semi-annual hands-on educational event, The Family Pig, here at our Pacific Northwest homestead, over at farmsteadmeetsmith.com, we host a purely digital membership program with an archive of film and textual resources years deep now for you to dive deeper into your food journey with. And both our classes and online program include access to our private community Facebook page for your continued education and fellowship. 
We've been told that our classes are life-changing and the membership program unparalleled in quality and quantity. To get a taste of our education, search farmsteadmeetsmith.com and our YouTube channel for our free films, conversations, and downloads. Explore how we and other meatsmiths across the globe may best come alongside you, putting the knife in your hand, article by article, and comment thread by comment thread, and can support you in building your home around the harvest. Please head to farmsteadmeatsmith.com today. Basically, the only readily hot and fast cooker on a lamb, something you can pan fry really quick or roast at high temperature quickly, is the loin, is the muscle along the spine. The tenderloin is so small on lambs, it almost doesn't count. It's like, it's a nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, so I usually just leave it on there um, with, if I'm going to do lamb chops, it'll be on the loin chops, mm-hmm. little mini T-bones basically. Mm-hmm. So when it comes to that shoulder, this is the other step of quartering. You could break it at a couple different spots. You could okay. remove it. You could pick the end of the sternum. That's an easy one. And that works just fine. Go to the end of the sternum and... Follow with your knife the rib that goes to the end of the sternum. And you're now you're just in between those two ribs, whatever they may be. It'll probably be the sixth and the seventh, and that's fine. And then you go right up to where it meets at the spine. And then you can saw through the spine and then finish your cut down, and now you've got the shoulder quarter. And if you did that neat trick of binding the front shank up, you're done. There's your That's your shoulder roast. Yeah. Um, if you wanted to make it a, a little smaller, a little more manageable, go to the bottom of the shank and just below that will be the brisket, the chest bone, the sternum. Cut the sternum off. Now it's almost a square roast. Cut the neck off. Now it really is more right. small and mm-hmm. it'll fit a little easier. Mm-hmm. And you can braise that or you can slow roast it. Mm-hmm. And if it's a fat enough lamb, again, it'll have a f- nice fat covering and you can just slow roast it without worrying about it drying out. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it's so versatile. The shanks are wonderful. We've braised those. I like a beer braise on the lamb shanks. A little stock and some beer. Low and slow. Mm-hmm. No rolling bubbles, just some simmers. Um, and then you have one of the trickiest parts. And that's like the plate is one way to put it. Mm. Or the brisket or the breast. Uh-huh. And that is the meat that's on the outside of the ribs, below the arm, and that stretches all the way back on the flank to the back leg, that stretchy, flanky mm-hmm. part. That meat is what would become bacon on a pig. That's belly on a pig. On a lamb, it's tricky because it's laced with really tough collagen. It's layered with fat meat, fat meat, just like a pig. It's much thinner than a pig. Mm-hmm. I guess that also depends on how fat, how mature the lamb is, mm-hmm. the sheep is, but... And then it's also laced with some pretty tough collagen. And the older the Mm -hmm. sheep is, the tougher that stuff will be. Yeah. And um, so one of my favorite ways to deal with that, those are, that's all brazers to me, Mm -hmm. those things. And I like to leave the bones in. And so what I'll end up having is this long roll of boneless, where's my hands, bone, boneless flanky meat and then you start to see the ribs up to the sternum and it ends up being you know about Mm -hmm. that long Mm -hmm. and you can roll it from the back oh yes it's so pretty when you do that yeah Mm -hmm. you can roll it up it's really pretty but these are all low and slow brazers yeah and um i like to eventually you know i guess it depends there's so many different ways but um you can braise the whole thing Get your big heavy pot, stock, half a bottle of wine. Okay, a whole bottle of wine. (laughs) Carrots, onions, celery. Put the lid on, cocked just a little bit so some steam can escape because you don't want things to get too super hot. Uh And then just put the heat on, full blast. And as soon as you see the liquid threatening to bubble, turn it down by half. Yeah. And if it starts to threaten to bubble again, turn it down by half again. Until you lock in a subtle, tremulous simmer mm-hmm. where just the surface is trembling just a little bit. You barely want to see bubbles at all. And just let it go. You know, sprig of rosemary, some thyme in there. Again, I like to just cut a whole garlic 
uh, bulb in half and throw that in there mm -hmm. and um, let it go for many, many hours. Maybe halfway through, if you feel inclined, you could turn it over if it's not fully submerged. Yeah. And it's a wonderful braise. Mm -hmm. You just pull it out and you can serve it all up then on a bed of rice. And maybe you could even strain out the cooking liquid and you do want to strain it and then reduce it. Mm -hmm. And then you have a very unctuous and delicious sauce. It's especially nice to have that with these braised meats. Mm -hmm. They just go so well. The soft, chewable meat now mm -hmm. with the stocky, almost sticky. Yeah. Um, it will be broth. sticky. Yeah. Yeah, because that sternum has got lots of collagen on right. it. Right. Yeah. And uh, I like to just do a little splash of wine or vinegar in the stock as it's reducing because that'll just give it a little more acid. Mm -hmm. And a little acidic tang is really nice to counter the richness of the meat. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. And if you want, so that's one way. Mm -hmm. If you want to take this a step further, you can take, take the meat out of the pot, let it cool till you can handle it. And then you can just slip each bone out. It'll just flip right out. And then you have this boneless sheet of braised lamb. And you can put that in your fridge and it helps to press it overnight but you can kind of get away with not doing that you know maybe cut it in half and put it on a cafeteria tray because you have a cafeteria tray right <laughs> we do and then put another cafeteria tray on top with like a mason jar quart of water <clears throat> so it's weighted and then the next day for dinner you can take it all out cut the uh the boneless braised flank into the strips like that big Mm -hmm. and uh, like inch by six inch strips or something mm -hmm. and then dredge them in flavored flour and basically deep fry them in butter just hot fast <laughs> push, push, in a bunch of butter and you'll get a nice browning and so what you have is this deep fried braised yeah. meat and oh. it's really good oh my gosh it's a frenchy thing or belgium i can't remember yeah okay. um really nice mm. neat one way that's one way to deal with the tough mm -hmm. and that's what i think about when i think of butchering a lamb yeah, yeah. are those things we haven't even mentioned chops mm -hmm. those are a thing you know what they are <laughs> you can get chops i would say oh and i wanted to say tartare how to do the tartare oh, okay. so now i guess we're going to the cookery of the loin okay you could just look at the vertebrae with your eyeballs and make each chop the width of a vertebrae that's the way to go, which basically means you cut all the meat away to the thickness of a vertebra, and then you put the vertebra so it's resting solidly on the table, and you chop it with your cleaver or your camp site hatchet, and mm -hmm. that's a chop. Mm -hmm. Hot and fast on those. Now, if it is a ewe or an older sheep, you know, like when you're pushing three years old, there will be some exterior the fell muscle which is just under the skin that'll be kind of tough and after pan frying it won't quite be tender it'll still be a little chewy doesn't really bother me but if you wanted to you could take your loin <clears throat> after having cut off the flank and the brisket that we just talked about and you could you could peel that silver skin off the top and it only if it's an old sheet and you would notice that it would be a little more tender mm -hmm. <clears throat> on the chop end. So that's one thing. And you just go all the way down the line and you'll get, what is it? If you quarter it where I told you to, you'll get six loin chops and eight rib chops mm -hmm. per side. And that's great. Um, if you don't want to do that, then you would, with your knife, take the whole loin out as you would the back strap of a deer just go right down along the spine and you're basically peeling out use your hands too it's very seamable you could almost strip it out just by hand once you get it started with the knife and then you'll have this long boneless lean and tender loin meat and if you want to be super cool mm -hmm. you could make tartare uh, yes. or carpaccio i don't know what the technical word is but it's so good. And it's one of those things where 
you don't please don't over season it you just want to have yes which means that's true. if you're keeping it simple keep it pure so really good olive oil like don't just get the crappy stuff get some spend a little money on the olive oil mm-hmm. please and even some nice salt um and take the whole boneless loin and then put your knife on it but perpendicular to the mm-hmm. length of the loin so the loin's like this you're holding it on the table you got your knife and scrape mm-hmm. scrape 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 and basically scrape it until the whole loin is gone mm-hmm. and what will remain are the few collagen fascia strips that are in the loin they're few and they're tender but those will even by this process of scraping and all of the meat will be balling up on your knife and you can wipe it off into a bowl or something as you go and you're just scraping all the meat off mm-hmm. and that meat is it's it's completely uh almost disintegrated it's not mm-hmm. there's no chunks it's not mm-hmm. it's not finely chopped it's more than that it's not even ground it's like something it's deconstructed yeah and <clears throat> you're it's scraping it, it off it, it is altered it's so good yeah. yeah and just some really wonderful nutty olive oil some flaky salt we maybe yeah. some capers right but only maybe yeah maybe a squeeze of lemon <laughs> okay here. only a squeeze of lemon yeah. with olive oil and salt oh Oh, okay, but so good. what we mean by simple is when you're going to go for carpaccio, don't get ingredients that are actually kind of an apology for the fact that you're doing carpaccio. Like right. People, I've seen that on a professional level do it, and they're like, okay, we're going to do carpaccio, and we're going to get these crazy flavored olive oils to go with it. And, so much, and they pack all these extra superfluous ingredients that they think will entice someone mm-hmm. to eat this carpaccio because it is different. Mm-hmm. And then... They end up not tasting the carpaccio. They you taste not, not the lamb. You don't taste the lamb. Raw meat is very mild. It, it, yeah. you, you don't, it doesn't have the, you know, the aid of cooking with browns it, caramelizes it, and just makes it rich and punchy. None of that. It's really mild and it's easy. It's really mm-hmm. easy to overpower it. So salt it sufficiently. Don't mm-hmm. be, because that's the one thing. Salt won't overcome it. It will only lift it up. Mm-hmm. Salt is a servant. It lifts things up. Yeah. And then just a little bit of olive oil. A little bit of squeeze of lemon. Maybe. <laughs> little. And it's so good. So on a really mild cracker or mm-hmm. crostini or something. It's meant to be simple. Mm-hmm. You know that word you started talking about that and you said it's simple. That word has taken on a new meaning for me. And I don't think I've told you this before. But <clears> yesterday <throat> I was reading Thomas Aquinas calls God simple Mm, mm -hmm. okay and that's a little mind-blowing yeah because you think no god's this big amazing crazy not contingent blowing our mind kind of thing yeah um being i should say um or maybe non-being i don't know ground of being um god is not disintegrated mm, mm-hmm. there is an integrity and that's what we mean by simple mm-hmm. and i think you can extrapolate that to anything including cooking yeah but keeping things sim- you know because we in our culture we that word sometimes means dumb or that, that right. person's simple it's kind of an insult yeah but simple the, the simplicity of something is actually referring to its unity it's um it's yeah, it's integrity. Yeah. Yeah, as a whole thing. It's not divided. Yeah. It's it's consistent, uh-huh. right? Like you, what you want is you want simple gold. You mm-hmm. want pure gold. You don't want right. a mock complex like, gold. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah, or like some other metal that's been like covered in gold. Like uh-huh. that's not simple and that's not as valuable. Yeah. But Yeah. Anyway, it's a tangent, but keep your lamb simple. Do. Yeah. Yeah. Don't dilute it. With yeah. complexity. Yeah. Um, I think that was all I really had. I just kind of let you go there for a little bit. Yeah. We didn't even talk about offal. We could. I yeah. mean, we have in the past. Lamb but... offal. Um, you know what, actually, as you were talking, it was, 
you bounce back and forth sometimes. I'm just observing you because mm-hmm. I like observing you. No. Um, <laughs> well, moving me. on. Um, that you bounce back and forth sometimes between just kind of this off the cuff, mm-hmm. like um, instinctual approach to mm-hmm. a cutting. And then sometimes, you know, and I guess I mean kind of casual. Mm hmm. But then sometimes you're very rigid about something. Yeah. And that takes time, but it also takes trusting yourself. But it also, what am I trying to say? You're very observant. And I'm kind of um, speaking from my own baggage right now. But I'm, lear- I'm reading um, Charlotte Mason mm-hmm. right now, um, who, it, who has reminded us of one of our culinary heroes, Jane, Jane Grigson. Grigson. <laughs> She's like the Jane Grigson of the education world. Yeah. I would say, with a little Tom Aquinas thrown in there. A charming British woman. Yeah. She's yeah. so charming and quaint and beautiful and... She's like everything you want your grandmother to be. Um, <laughs> but she's teaching me about the power of observation, mm. of, of letting children... And of course, everything comes down to freedom. But yeah. letting a child use their own natural powers of observation yeah. and letting them be... Yeah. Which is hard. Mm-hmm. Like letting, giving them tons of room, mm-hmm. tons of space. And, um, but I see you, I have seen you do that a lot over the course of the past decade. Like y- when you are left alone to just like observe, mm-hmm. even something silly or seemingly tedious or trivial, like whether or not part of your lamb is touching the wall of the refrigerator. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like you just, you go, hmm not quite exactly the way I wanted it and I don't know exactly what the ramifications of that might be as in it might be compromised somehow but I'm gonna just fix it Mm -hmm. you know and you might not even be able to articulate why you'd want to fix something but then you do and or even like put like taking a fork on top of your shepherd's pie Mm -hmm. and and increasing the surface area Mm -hmm. thereby and um it's just those little steps I think I stole that one Okay. But sure. But that you person do it. was doing the same thing. Yeah. Whereas yeah. I, I, I'm, I, I will see someone do it and I don't always take that extra step to do it. And then I go, oh, I should have done that, you know, later. But I just, I think it's encouraging. I want to encourage our members mm-hmm. and our, our listeners, our audience to, to pr- take that time with yourself and practice observing mm-hmm. you're gonna be surprised at exactly how much you can really pick up on with your own eyes your own nose yeah that's why i like to say it is an intrinsic prowess that we all have mm-hmm. and i almost feel like it's as basic as we all have the same tools mm-hmm. like sure hands yeah. and fire and flesh mm-hmm. and if you just kind of jumble all those things together Mm-hmm. similar things are going to arise at the end. At least some basic rules will that seem to apply semi-universally, mm-hmm. if that's possible to be semi. But <laughs> no, I think that all it is is uh, when I, I still feel this way. Like I do things during slaughter, and I think this applies to everyone that does any manual task. You do things that you can't articulate you do them first and the articulation follows. Mm. Like, oh, that's why I was doing that for seven years. <laughs> because right. it, it made sense on a more physical level than it did on a cerebral articulated one. It's actually harder to articulate a reason than it is to live by one. <laughs> than it is mm-hmm. to like act by mm-hmm. some rationale. Mm-hmm. Because the rationale, I think, is intrinsic to the object. So all you have to do is be a little docile, yeah, a little observant. Mm-hmm. Try not to just coerce it into your cubic form or whatever. Try to be a little receptive. Mm-hmm. And it'll just happen by osmosis. It's not because you're being lazy. Mm-hmm. It's, cause it's because you're doing it. You know? yeah. You're working with a carcass over and over and over again. And um, you will be naturally drawn towards efficiency. And that natural efficiency also leads to beauty and to culinary excellence and and i mean efficient in like the deep sense not just expedited 
Yeah. But like it's uh, where every action counts and sometimes accomplishes three or four things Mm -hmm. and has an end goal sort of inscribed in the process itself. Mm -hmm. Um, And so if you just watch yourself sometimes doing things. So I, what I always say is the key is to uh, start doing them. Yeah. Just start doing it. Yeah. Start slaughtering your lambs and cooking the flesh and you will be surprised what you already know about all of that. That's true. And, you know, I think that one of the hurdles that can get in our way of that prowess is taking our likes and dislikes a little too seriously. Yeah. So you might want to, you know, be willing, definitely be willing to be like, this tastes weird, but I I think I'm going to like it anyway. You know, (laughs) and you're like, but it's actually not that weird when I think about it. Actually, it's uh, this is actually just richer than everything I've tasted. Uh And um, I only need to have like five bites and... Yeah. Or maybe I need something tangy in order to eat more. So we should ferment some vegetables or something or get some sauerkraut out. Uh-huh. But I think it can all be, you can, it's too easy to get hung up on preference, you know? Yeah. There's too much fat. Yeah. I don't like that. Yeah. Like, well, you don't really know that. <laughs> don't take it too seriously. Yeah. Yeah. Don't take yourself too seriously. <laughs> Especially since the lamp, like the yield is fatty. Yeah. If you're docile to the yeah. yield, mm-hmm. it, you will be enriched. Mm-hmm. You'll be enriched mm-hmm. for sure. Yeah. Well, thanks for joining me today. My pleasure. Yeah. Thank you, Meat Smiths, for joining us and giving us your attention. And um, yeah, I've got nothing else more to say. Um, we love doing this, and thanks for listening to us on a weekly basis. And hopefully we can um, see you at one of our classes someday or online in our membership program. Or um, We haven't been too good about getting inside the comment boxes in the, on the YouTube. But, oh, um, yeah. We do actually see a lot of the comments. We're just not good at yeah. answering back. I try to, but yeah. Thanks for engaging as much as you can. and um, I got to put more. I, I have to allocate my time to the membership. Yeah, yeah. Well, I I get to. It's pretty great. But we love seeing... Sometimes we do get to answer those questions, actually. Mm -hmm. You know, but... um, Yeah. Anyway. Well, and we do... We have the family pig coming up in June. Mm -hmm. Go to farmsteadmeatsmith.com and look up um, upcoming classes. I think it's under the harvest Mm -hmm. or something. Actually, we even have... We moved it. It's on, it's on the, oh, the main nav bar. It says as it the were. family pig. It says yeah. the family pig, yeah. Click there on. Yeah. <laughs> and you will see what the family pig is all about. Yeah. Um, that's coming in June. We haven't posted any more classes, but we should have more coming in the fall. Yeah. Yeah, the June, I think, will be it for this part mm-hmm. of the year until, you know, probably October, November. Yeah. So. When, because you see the pigs must grow. Yeah, and we are going on the porks. We are going on vacation in June, so we're not even going to get pigs until July, which means we're going to have late family pigs later in 2019. Like five days late. Well, yeah, there's lots of (laughs) contingencies there. Yeah, Yeah. (laughs) like when you can get the pigs and stuff. (laughs) No, actually, we're we're going on vacation Fourth of July, so it won't even be till anyway. Yeah, I don't have to talk about scheduling to our listeners. (laughs) (laughs) It's boring. Uh, But also. Do check out the Meatsmith membership. Yes. It's yeah. open. That's the Registration thing. is open. Mm-hmm. And we're working with a local but incredibly famous filmmaker. Famous in the sense that I don't think people know his name, but if you have seen anything on the YouTube machine, uh-huh. uh, he's probably been a part of it. Yeah. Um, some pretty awesome stuff. And so he's working with us to create more meatsmith videos yeah for our membership yeah more winsome and earnest instruction in home on... harvesting mm-hmm. um, yeah so. we'll, we'll we'll release more of that when they're actually being released but it's only probably only a couple weeks away yeah that we'll be starting or even when this episode is aired i'm hoping we can start adding it in april yeah adding, yeah so cool thanks again everyone have a good Easter and oh yes, and Divine Mercy Sunday. Let's let's mm-hmm. see you Divine Mercy Sunday if you're in the Pacific Northwest. Okay, take care. Bye. <laughs>
You can receive updates on all our brand new content as it's released by signing up for our email newsletter. Free download of Brandon's thoughts on meat cookery included. Go to farmsteadmeatsmith.com and sign up on the homepage. Thanks again for listening and keep in touch.